Hello, BookTube. I have a tag for you, and I thought for a change I would do a tag on Tag Tuesday <laughs> instead of some other random day of the week. Uh, this is the 20 Bookish Questions tag, which I saw on Book Time with Elvis, but Mark did not tag me because he hates me because I smell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm going to do it anyway, because although I've done a number of bookish question type tags, I've never done this one. And although there is some overlap in some of the questions, as I've said on this channel a few times, I think that's important. It's important for us all to remember that new people are finding us all the time. And that repeating some old answers is a good way of introducing yourself to those new people. I have quite a few new people on this channel since the last time I did any kind of numbered bookish question tag. Uh, so I thought we'd just go through with the 20 questions and see what we have here. Number one is, how many books is too many books in a book series? And my answer to this question is two. <laughs> Even though I am the first to admit uh, that I have loved some books in series. For instance, uh, The Ill-Earth War, the second book in the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever. And a bunch of other things, uh, a bunch of other books, fa fantasy and science fiction being the primary target here. Uh, but although I have loved those books, I have often thought that the ones that I've loved would have worked better as standalone novels. I think it's lazy on the part of an author to just assume, especially in the fantasy genre, to just assume that they're going to write a 20-book series. I think that's lazy. It can't help but uh, deform your plotting at the very least, to say nothing of the arc of character developments, I'd much prefer it if... Uh, I'm perfectly happy for authors to revisit the worlds that they create. Like, for instance, uh, John Mortimer's Rumpo books, where time is passing, but there's no reason to read them in the sequence in which they were written. Something like that, I'm okay with. Uh, but a, a book that that is carrying over active plot lines from earlier books and not recapitulating them correctly so that you have to read those earlier books to get the most out of it, I, yeah, yeah, I'd rather not. Uh, question number two is, how do you feel about cliffhangers? I love them, of course. I'm a devoted fan of old pulp literature, and in addition to that, long before there was a book tube, I wrote a series of potboiler science fiction novels uh, in installments. I wrote them either longhand or on a, a tandy, heavy air quotes, portable word processor that showed me two lines of prose on a little window and that I could then I could print that stuff out. And I used to do that for about 20 people. I would mail those things out uh, every single time I finished a new installment. And those were basically science fiction fantasy pot boilers, so they ended on cliffhangers. Every chapter, almost, ended on a cliffhanger, sometimes multiple cliffhangers. I got pretty good at it, and I enjoyed it a lot, so I love them. Uh, provided they're cliffhangers to chapters, or to serialized, serialized literature. A cliffhanger in a novel is an abomination, <laughs> because it means two things by necessity. First, that the novel in which it takes place is incomplete, and second, that the novel that follows it is incomplete. I'm a big fan of complete novels. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Question number three is hardback or paperback. Notice what's missing? Ebooks are missing. Uh, what are you doing, baby? Oh, <laughs> I wish I could turn the camera and show you. The bean is over on the bed, and uh, earlier today I was out and about, and I, I, uh, got smooched by a lot of dogs. I got jumped on by a lot of dogs. So when I got back to the house, my pants were a mess. Uh, so I took them off to be done in the laundry. And I, I learned my lesson, which is to take everything out of your pockets. You don't want to put a cell phone through the laundry. And I took my keys out too. And I dropped them on the bed. And now the bean is, I don't know if you can see this, she's trying to bury the keys. <laughs> she has found them and she is trying to bury them for future use. <laughs> Baby, it's not edible. You can bury it all you want, but it is... <laughs> I don't know how, she's, how long she's going to keep doing that. Uh, but if I have to choose between the two options being given here, hardcover and paperback, now my preference is hardcover, just because they're more durable. I used to love paperbacks of all kinds. Uh, Penguin Classic paperbacks, mass market science fiction and fantasy paperbacks, and I still do. I, I think on one level they are a perfect machine. And there aren't many perfect technological devices. But uh, 
I'm hard on my stuff. I read, I read my stuff and, you know, uh, manhandle it just a bit. I try to be delicate, but it doesn't always work. And uh, hardcovers take that a lot better than paperbacks do. Uh, question number four is your favorite book. For me, that is something we've seen just recently on this channel, Ovid's Metamorphoses. The Metamorphoses by the Roman poet Ovid. Uh, question number five is least favorite book. My least favorite book of all time is also the worst single book ever written by anyone at any time in any language, and it is The Love Letter by Kathleen Sheen. Uh, number six is love triangles, yes or no. I'm assuming this means in the books that I read and <laughs> not in real life, <laughs> but I've always found them I, I've almost never read a fiction, this is fiction that we're talking about, I've almost never read a fictional account of a love triangle that reads at all, and I mean at all, even remotely like how love triangles actually happen. When they happen in real life, they don't seem to me to be anything like the things that I read in fiction. Understandably, maybe because writers of the made-up stories need to goose the drama, but when you read nonfiction, especially biographies, you read a lot about love triangles, and they don't ever happen the way they do in fiction. They're always weirder and less energetic. Uh, question number seven is the most recent book you just couldn't finish. Don't have a candidate. Not in a long time. Um, I finish what I start, usually, these days with reading. Uh, question number eight is a book you, you've, you're you currently reading. This doesn't quite work for me. If I'm not currently reading a book because I'm making a video. I read fast enough and I read enough during a day so that I tend to just finish the book that I'm reading. Uh, but it was claimed by J.R. Ward, uh, the author of The Interminable, probably 150, 250, maybe 200,000 uh, books in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series, uh, claimed is uh, the start of a new series set in that extended fictional world. But focusing, it looks like, not on vampires, but on werewolves. <laughs> so, and uh, that that was uh, one that I just read recently. And it was terrific, as all J.R. Ward books are terrific. I'm hoping, as I alluded to in an earlier question here, I'm hoping that uh, J.R. Ward puts a lot of effort into making this an independent feeling series, even though it's set in a shared universe. I'm hoping that this is a real jump on point, and that you don't need to know about the Black Dagger Brotherhood any more than what is told to you in a paragraph in the first book. I'm hoping that that stays true. Um, question number nine is the last book you recommended to someone. Uh, that would be to one of you. Uh, I, I get emails. I get emails all the time. My email is on every video. That is not to a merch store. That is not a dummy email. That is my email, and I'd be happy to hear from you. Email me about anything. I have people email me about family issues, personal questions, pet questions oh my god i get at least five pet questions a day and also all sorts of bookish stuff and one of you recommended wanted a recommendation about a tolstoy biography and i recommended Henri troyat's book his his biography as opposed to recommending a.n wilson's book uh, question number 10 is the oldest book you've read by publication date uh, i guess that depends on what we mean by publication there were there were copies that were available for public consumption to be bought and sold of Gilgamesh. <laughs> and I've read that. I think that would probably be the oldest book I've read. Uh, and the, the question number 11 is the newest book you've read by publication. And that would be a book that I think is coming out uh, in the late summer, early fall. Uh, a new book about uh, Joseph Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father, uh, during his time as ambassador to the court of St. James. Uh, so not original ground by any means. That period of Joseph Kennedy's life uh, has been studied many times. Uh, this book, I think, is coming out in August or September, and I'm still mulling. I liked it. I largely liked it. Joe Kennedy is a very hard figure to write about. And uh, I, I liked it enough so that I'm wondering whether or not I want to review it and maybe push to review it somewhere big. Uh, we shall see. I'm, I'm still mulling over. Probably that decision will, I will let that decision wait until the hardcover. I'll reread the hardcover and then uh, and assess it. I'll let it sit until then. Uh, question number 12 is favorite author. That would be the Dutch humanist Erasmus. Uh, question number 13 is buying books or borrowing books. <laughs> you notice there's, there's an option that's missing. <laughs> First of all, I don't borrow books and I don't lend them. Disaster. 
ensues. The last time I borrowed a book was decades and decades ago, long before most of you were born. And I no sooner got it out of my bag, literally, it was no sooner out of my bag than it was torn to shreds by a crowd of beagles with their, with their white tails in the air like that. Literally torn to shreds. So that there wasn't any part of it left intact. <laughs> as soon as I got it out of my bag, it was completely destroyed. And of course, when it comes to lending books, I've never got a lent book back. Never. From anybody. I don't think anybody ever has. So I don't lend or borrow books. And I try not to buy them either, except secondhand. If we're counting secondhand, I, I do that. But even then, I prefer to have credit that I'm burning off rather than spend money on books. <laughs> no, no, but the third alternative is the critic's alternative, which is to request it from the publisher and get it in the mail. <laughs> I guess that it's too small a subject sample. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Question number 14 is a book you dislike that everyone seems to love. Uh, when I hear a question like this, I automatically think of BookTube now. I don't know if that's a change in me. Well, it certainly is a change in me. Forever and ever, I would have thought of my fellow book critics, my fellow book reviewers, professional, semi-professional, working all the time, that sort of thing. I would for a long time have thought of them when I thought of a book that everybody loves that I don't. And in a case like that, the list is endless. We just saw Rachel Cusk on this channel, but there are a bunch of others. Nobody is allowed to dislike Otessa Moshfe, for instance. Nobody's allowed to dislike Emma Klein. Uh, it, is, it is actually technically illegal by international law at The Hague for anyone to say anything negative about Detransition Baby, for instance. That's in the formal critical circles. But when I hear this question now, I automatically think of BookTube. And not just BookTube, but this little corner of BookTube. And fortunately, I'm so happy to say that the question does not apply in this little corner of BookTube. We're all over the map in terms of what we read. We are not the larger channels on BookTube or the YA crowd on BookTube that very much moves as a herd. We are not that at all. So I, th that doesn't come up on this part of BookTube. That's why I think I love it so much. Uh, so I don't have an answer to this question. There's no book that all of you seem to love. We're all in disagreement about everything all the time. <laughs> uh, Question number 15 is, bookmarks or dog ears? I realize that tempers on this subject run hot. <laughs> and I love me tassel bookmarks. I really, really do. And again, I want to point out that on ebooks you don't have this worry. You can bookmark anything you want. And you put all sorts of markers in a book and not worry about it at all. But I have to admit, even though it's going to infuriate some of you, <laughs> that when I am reading an advanced copy, do I have one? Here, well, you all know what an advanced copy is. When I'm reading an advanced copy, an ARC of a book, so it's not the finished copy. It's not the one that's going to sit in my library if I decide to keep it. It's just an ARC. When I'm reading one of those, I will dog ear pages. Just because it's so easy and it's right there and it's not, a, a, a you know, the finished copy of the book that anybody's going to care about. And it's very convenient to just go back to those. And a little bit of fun. To go back to a dog, if I dog ear, let's say I dog ear six pages in in, uh, in six different locations in an ARC, some review copy that I'm reading, and then I set it aside. I finish the book, I cogitate on it a bit on a dog walk, and then I set it aside and I come back to it a month later. It's also fun to, to go to those dog eared pages and see if I'm automatically going to know why I dog eared. I don't make any other marks. I think that's fun. I like that. I know, it's heresy. I'm dog hearing pages. Let, let's just move on. <laughs> uh, question number 16 is a book you can always reread. Uh, I have an example right here. I have a prop. I just found it uh, in the neighborhood in one of those, uh, just a, a box of free books with a sign on it on the sidewalk while I was walking the beam. It's this lovely trade paperback copy of The Lord of the Rings. There's Gandalf walking in the rain. Uh, this thing was uh, badly used and falling apart, but is still serviceable. It will still work just fine as a, a copy of Lord of the Rings. And it's also a trade paperback one volume that I don't have. I don't have this. Uh, it's pretty green. Didn't have this before. Uh, I reinforced it because the, the, the uh, cover was really, really weak. <laughs> so, uh, but, of course, once I, re once I finished reinforcing it, I, I, I know those of you who are purists and collectors out there, I am not saying, that I know perfectly well, this destroys the resale value of this book. I'm not, I don't care about resale value. I don't plan on getting rid of this book. Uh, it sure does make it durable uh, if you do it, if you do it right. And naturally, when I was finished reinforcing it, I started reading bits of it. 
and fell under its spell immediately again. So there are plenty of books that I can reread. You're looking at a lot of them over my right shoulder. Uh, question number 17 is, can you read while hearing music? I certainly can, but I would rather not. I can read while hearing music, but I absolutely cannot read while listening to music. And who wants to hear music without listening to it? So I tend to read in total absorbed silence, with the only outside world distraction being one hand idly petting the bean as she sleeps or snoozes. <laughs> uh, question number 18 is one point of view or multiple points of view in a book? Uh, if it's done well, multiple points of view. I, I prefer one point of view just because most authors, since we're talking fiction here, can't do it well. Most of them can't. <laughs> so, And since they can't, and since no one's ever told them that they can't, what you end up reading is multiple points of view that all sound like exactly the same person, and that's annoying. That's <laughs> very, very annoying. If it's done well, though, uh, if it, and if the differences complement each other, if the people, the multiple points of view aren't just noticing the exact same things, then I can like it, but it's rare. Uh, now, question number 19 is, do you read a book in one sitting or over multiple days? Usually in one sitting. Uh, and question number 20 is, uh, who do you tag? And even though Book Time with Elvis did not tag me because he hates me, I want to tag a bunch of people. I think these are fun questions, even if you've done a variation of them before. Like, for instance, the Bookish Bryants. Haven't tagged them in a long while. Of course, Mark Richardson, my partner in crime. Uh, Matthew at Maybury Book Club. Uh, James Holder, feel free to do these questions. I'm interested in all of them because they are the type of nosy personal question that I love. Uh, the Roz at the Scaly Dandelion. <laughs> I'd love to hear your answers to these questions. And also Courtney Farader. America's Jewish mother haven't tagged her in forever. Uh, so there you go. That is the 20 bookish questions tag. A ton, ton of fun for a tag Tuesday. Uh, but I've got other videos to make. Not a bombardment. <laughs> Not 10 or 15. But other videos to make. So I'll wrap this up and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.